Welcome everybody to the online seminar series, Machine Learning Needs Mathematical Optimization. So today we are extremely pleased of having uh, Professor Castro, Jordi Castro, who is a full professor at the Department of Statistics and Operations Research at the Universitat Politecnica de Catalunya, and who is also a member of the group of uh, numerical optimization and modeling of the same university. So his research interests are in uh, computational optimization, large scale optimization, continuous and discrete optimization, linear and nonlinear network optimization, multi commodity network flows, interior point methods, who is, uh, which is the topic of today, and mathematical programming methods for uh, structure problems. In terms of uh, real-world applications, uh, he has worked uh, on statistical disclosure, control, telecommunication problems, short- and long-term planning of electricity generation. So his research has appeared in uh, the leading journals in the field, such as Mathematical Programming, Management Science, Operations Research, and SIEM Journal on Optimization. And he has received funding from various research councils, including the European Commission, as well as from the private sector. He has done ample uh, service to the community, uh, and he is um, he has had uh, several editorial duties. Uh, he's currently uh, the technical editor of mathematical programming uh, computation. So thank you very much again, uh, Jordi, for joining today. To the audience, please remember that if you have a very, very urgent question, you can always put the question on the chat and I will read it for uh, Jordi. Otherwise, we will uh, have time for a Q&A session at the end. The floor is yours, Jordi. Okay, so um, thank you very much, Dolores, for the invitation uh, to give this the, the, to give this talk. And um, about the possible topics, I, I I thought that maybe the most interesting for the audience because this is a seminar on European data scientists. Um, maybe the, the the most interesting will be um, how to apply interior point methods, uh, which is one of my research topics in some applications, data science, but also some alternative applications. So this is the topic. Um, so basically my talk will be, uh, uh, will be divided in two parts. In the first part, I will try to make it not, not so large. I will just will give some details about this, this specialized interoperable methods I have been working in the last years. And in the second part, that probably is the most interesting for most of you, I will focus on some applications of, of this particular algorithm we have been working in the past, either alone or with some co-authors, okay? Um, at the end of, the, of these slides, there is a, a list of reference with uh, to, to, to all the papers, uh, uh, just to see the name of the co-authors, okay? So uh, the applications I, I'm sure I will have time to explain today will be support vector machines problems, a data confidentiality problems, which are data science problems. In the third uh, third position, I will I think I will have time to talk a little bit about uh, multi-stage stochastic optimization application of this interpol algorithm. And uh, depending on the time, I will talk or not about uh, the solution of convex cost flow pro problems. Okay. So let's just start just introducing this this interpol method, which is a method for for a structure and huge, large uh, scale problems. Okay. 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 So when we try to solve a, a large scale or a huge problem, usually these kind of problems have a, quite a lot of a structure. Uh, for instance, uh, th these models usually are models that have several periods or several commodities. And usually it's possible to decompose the problem or to divide the problems in different groups of variables a group of constraints, okay? Um, but unfortunately, if not, the problem will be quite easy. Uh, we have in these models, some linking or constraints or linking variables that couple all, all the variables of the constraints on the rise. The, 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 this modeling situation appears usually in problems from data science, in logistics, stochastic optimization, and these problems usually tend to be very large or sometimes huge even, okay? Uh, when we have this kind of large scale, uh, huge problems, interoperable methods are known to be a very successful method. Uh, 
But unfortunately, for some of these problems, uh, because of their structure or because they are so huge, even interoperable methods may have some difficulties. Okay, and then that's why sometimes we need some specialized interoperable methods. What's the main difference between standard interoperable methods such as those algorithms implemented in Simplex, Groovy, Express, Mosaic, and this other specialized interval methods. The main difference is the way they solve the, the, the Newton direction. In the standard interval methods, these algorithms, these the, the solvers usually uh, solve the, the, the normal equations by, by, by Cholesky factorizations. These are very efficient, very robust, okay? But when the problems are huge, they, they, they may have some, some numerical problems, okay? Uh, computational branch. On the other hand, specialized interpret methods normally use some sort of conjugate gradient uh, or mixed conjugate gradient with Cholesky factorization for the solutions of, of the Newton equation. Okay, and usually they need some some good preconditioner. Okay, in this case, um, today I will I will talk a little bit and we'll see applications of fast specialized interpret method. I've been working in the last years. It's implemented in, in the solver. The solver is named block IP. And it's a solver that solves the Newton's equations by combining Cholesky and conjugate gradient uh, factory, uh, conjugate gradients for the solutions of, uh, of the Newton direction. Okay. Um, uh, which is the type of structure uh, this algorithm is, is going to deal with? This is the standard problem for, for this particular algorithm. Uh, it's a, the objective function can be convex. So it, in this formulation, in this model, we have k different groups of variables of constraints. Um, N1, Nk denote the, the, the matrices associated to the, to the block of, of constraints, the different block of constraints, and x1, xk, the different variables. So the first group of constraints are the ball constraints. Basically, they mean that ni times xi is equal to bi, OK? And in the objective function, we have k different terms uh, with functions fi associated to each of the blocks of, of, of variables. These functions can be either linear or they can be quadratic, even convex, OK? The only restriction for this method for the efficiency of the method is that the Hessian of these functions will be diagonal matrices. Okay, so in, if we have a quadratic problem, the Q matrix defining the quadratic form, the quadratic term will be diagonal. Okay, and finally we have a last group of, of constraints, these ones which are the linking constraints that basically couple all all the all the groups of variables. Uh, usually in, in the simplex world. This kind of model, this kind of situations are usually solved by dancing wall decompositions or some cutting, cutting playing approaches. Um, what we'll see that the interpret methods can also be used to solve this kind of this kind of uh, this kind of models. Okay. Probably most of the audience is familiar, but if not, uh, let me very quickly remind. Um, uh, how path following methods work. Consider this generic optimization problem. This is a convex optimization problem. Here we minimize some convex function subject to some linear constraints and, and, and some box, box constraints. So basically here the constraints define a polyhedron. Th these are the constraints of the linear optimization problem. But the objective function here can be linear, quadratic, or convex. So if we consider the KKT conditions of the system, we have something like this. Okay, these are the KKT conditions, but in interpret methods, we'll go, we'll make a, a, a small change in these conditions. These are the complementary conditions that basically mean that the non, the the, um, the inequality constraints multiplied by the associated Lorentz multipliers, which are Z or W here. Okay, this product will be zero, has to be zero. Okay, basically these are complementary constraints. So x times z is zero, or u minus x times w is zero. Interval methods will perturb this condition and instead of zero, we'll consider a parameter mu. So basically, if we solve this system for a particular mu value, we are computing a point of this arc, which is named the central path, which is an arc that goes 
in the interior of the feasible region. Okay, so it can be, can be proved that for every new, there is only one solution of the system. So there is the central path that means that the central path is unique and interpret methods, uh, in particular, the interpret method we are considering here, which is a, a path following method. Okay, interpret methods follow this path somehow. So in an interpret method, for instance, the one implemented in Cplex, Groby, Express, Mosec, in an interpret method, we start at x0, which is a point close to the central path, then we move to x1, which is close to the central path, and we follow a path which is close to the central path until we go to the optimal to the optimal solution. This is basically a path following method. Okay. Um, the main computational burden of these methods is that at each iteration for the solution of this system, the KKT perturbed system, we have, we have to solve systems of this form, of the form A, Zeta, it's a diagonal scaling matrix, A transpose. This is the direction of the Lagrange multipliers for the equality constraint equal to some right hand side. So this is the difficult step in an interval method. Interval methods are very efficient in number of iterations, but each iteration can be very expensive computationally. So at each iteration, we have to solve that. A, the constraints matrix, scaling matrix, constraints matrix transpose, okay? Um, in some cases, for huge problems, usually, this system can be very, very difficult to solve. We'll see some results later in the application. We'll see that, for instance, Cplex, in some applications, needs about two months to solve uh, all the system of all the system of equations for a particular application. Okay. Okay. So, which is which is the strategy we follow in in this in this approach in this algorithm? The strategy is the following. Remind. Let's go back. Remind that we are solving problems of this form. So A has this form. We have block constraints, linking constraints. So splitting this structure, I'm going to move forward. Splitting this structure, we can see that this system can be solved much more efficiently. The idea is the following. Given A, that's my constraints matrix, that's zeta. Zeta here has been split, divided by the k different blocks of variables. Okay? So A C the transpose has this particular form. Okay, we have four submatrices. This first submatrix is obtained by the product of block constraints by the transpose of block constraints. This is the power of block constraints times linking constraints, linking times blocks, and linking by linking. Okay. Okay. So we consider these four parts. Okay. Then we can see that system A C the transpose, which has this expression, can be divided in into a smaller subsystems. Okay, using some Gaussian elimination here, we get these two smaller subsystems. Okay, so on one hand, we have to solve systems with B. B is this matrix. This is a block diagonal matrix, and systems with B can be solved efficiently by applying Cholesky factorizations to each of these blocks. And the second subsystem involves this, this term. This is the sure complement of this matrix, the normal equations matrix. Okay. And this system, if we try to solve it by a Cholesky factorization, we'll have uh, some difficulties because usually this system is large, it's still large, and it's completely dead. Okay. So the approach here is to solve this system by using a conjugate gradient. Okay. But of course, we need a good preconditioner to solve this system. That means we need some matrix says that when we pre-multiply this matrix on the right hand side, we get some better uh, structure. So the conjugate gradient will be more efficient. Fortunately, in this kind of problems, we can get a good preconditioner just by notice, noting that the inverse of the sure complement, okay, it's given, it's obtained by this infinite uh, power series, okay. This is possible because it can be proved that this term is determined the power series, okay? This matrix, the spectral radius of this matrix is less than one, so these terms are convergent. So in this approach, basically, we do the following. Uh, the preconditioner will be obtained by truncating this infinite power series at some term. If we take only the first term of the power series, the preconditioner M will be only D minus one. If we take two terms, will be something like that. Okay. Remember, I'm going back that D is this term. 
of the uh, of this matrix. Is this is this, this is a matrix in this matrix? Okay. Okay. So we only need to so, so to have a good preconditioner, uh, we only need to control two factors. The first thing is that the spectral radius is less than one. Well, this is this is known, but the farther for one, the better is the preconditioner. Okay. So, but that's that's application dependent. So that depends on the application. We don't know a priori how which will be the value of, of, of the spectral radius. It will be too close to one or, or too close to zero. The second factor which is important in the quality of the preconditioner is the matrix D. Okay. At each iteration of the conjugate gradient, we have to factorize matrix D. And the easier and the sparser, the better. But this is something that we can control a priori. Okay. There are some other results, for instance, it can be seen that when we add a Hessian, so when the objective function is quadratic or is convex, so we have a Hessian term, this Hessian term reduces the value of the spectral radius. So the spectral radius becomes closer to zero, and then this method is more efficient. Indeed, in the limit, when the Hessian goes to infinity, we have a diagonal Hessian. If all the terms of the diagonal Hessian tend to infinity, the spectral radius goes to zero. That's something that can be proved, okay? For instance, just to see um, how this works in some application, later I uh, will detail these applications, okay? But he, these are only some, some, some computational results. For some particular application, this is one of the instances of the data privacy application I will, I will see later, okay? These are results uh, considering a quadratic objective function. The Q matrix in the function is given by beta times identity. Here, I show the different values of betas, okay? So uh, I'm increasing beta, okay? And these are results used in CPLEX and this is specialized interpret method. So we see that increasing beta, the number of iterations at the CPU time with CPLEX, which, which implements a standard path-following method, a standard interpret method, increases in our, in our method, the number of iterations reduces and the CPU time also it's it's it's, it's less with the values of beta. Well, we can see also that uh, the, using a specialized interpret method that solves the, the system of equations combining Cholesky and conjugate gradient using this precondition can be much more efficient than a general solver. For instance, all these instances were solved in one minute. CPLEX required about ten hours in solving exactly the same instance. Okay, so. Uh, this is my last slide about the, the method, the, the interpret method. So all these ideas have been implemented in the last years in a solver. It's named Block IP. It's a solver for problem, problems with this particular block angular structure. Okay. It's a solver for linear optimization, for quadratic optimization, for convex optimization. Currently has about 20,000 lines of code. It, it, it deals with different type of matrix, so it can be specialized to different applications. And now, in the last in the last months, I've been working on a parallel version, which works pretty well, and it's promising. In some applications, it's, it's promising. Okay, so this is I, th this was a quick outline of the interpret method we are going to use for the solutions of the following applications. I will mainly focus on the first three. Okay, support vector machines a data privacy problem and multi-stage stochastic optimization. So let's just start with the first one. How support vector machine problems can be solved using this particular specialized interoperable method? Well, let's just start by quickly reviewing what's a support vector machine problem. I, I don't know if the audience is familiar with support vector machines, but I will give, uh, uh, will give some details. So consider that you have a data set uh, a, uh, a is a matrix of n points and n features, a features or attributes for each point. So by rows, we have data for individuals for points, and by columns, we have um, the different features of attributes of the points. And let's suppose that for each point, uh, we have uh, a value, y, that tell us if the point belongs to class plus one or minus one. So support vector machines are techniques that are used to compute a plane able to classify that when given a point, if that point belongs to class plus one or minus one. Um, 
let's look at these two pictures, okay? For instance, let's suppose that uh, all the triangles here are the points of class plus one, or the circles are the points of class minus one. And let's suppose that we want to compute a plane separating this class from this class. If I compute this plane, this plane, well, it, it really separates the two classes, but this uh, is not really a good, uh, a good plane, a good classifier. Why? Because this triangle is too close to the second class, and this circle is too close to the other class. So these, in general, are not good classifiers. So in super vector machines, we want a classifier similar to that one. What's the, the good property of that, this, uh, of this plane? The good property is that given the plane, we have two parallel planes such that the distance between these two planes is large enough. This distance is named the separation margin. So support vector machines try to find something like that, okay? A plane that sufficiently classic separates the two classes of points, okay? For instance, an example. An example, this is an example that I computed in my, here in my, in my computer. This is a real case, a real situation. Well, let's consider that you have a matrix of pictures. So each row of the matrix is a picture, okay? faces of people. And for each picture, you have 1,500 attributes, which are the pixels of the picture. So it's our numbers in 0, 1. That basically means the color, the gray of, of each pixel. And let's suppose that you want to compute a plane that separates the faces of males and females, men or women. And this is the result. This is the result uh, with some plane computed. This is a plane in, in this space, OK? And, and, uh, and, uh, and you can see that, for instance, given the picture, given the picture, uh, the true value is men, it's a man, but the predicted value is men. And you can see that in most of the cases, the plane has a good job separating one face from the other. Well, in some cases, it has some trouble. For instance, here, it's a man, but it's predicted as a woman, same here and here, OK? Um, it's difficult. When these techniques fail, it's difficult to give an explanation. Well, in that case, when they fail, usually when a man is classified as a woman, for some reason, the man, it's always smiling. I don't know if this has something to do with the plane computer, but well, that's the situation here. Okay, so that's an example. So what's the optimization problem solved by, 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 by a support vector machine? Basically, in support vector machines, we want to compute a plane denoted by W is the normal vector, okay, of the plane. Gamma is the independent term. Rs are variables that uh, compute when a point has been misclassified. Uh, in some problems, it's impossible to compute a planes totally separating one class from the other. So we, we, we need some extra variables to compute for the misclassifications. I, I will skip details, but basically this object, this problem basically mean, means the following. Minimize this term. This is the, 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 the normal uh, the normal vector times the normal vector. Minimizing this term, it can be seen it's equivalent to maximizing the separation margin plus this term, which is minimize the misclassification errors. Uh, the constraints, these constraints basically mean that uh, we try to compute a plane such that all the points plus ones are in the one half plane and all the minus ones are in the other half plane. Okay? So, um, this is the dual of this problem. I will skip details. This is the dual of this problem. And you can try to solve either the primal or the dual using an interpret method. Okay? Um, for instance, you can use Gurovic simplex to solve that. You use the Gurovic simplex to solve this, either the primal or the dual. You will have to solve systems with A, A transpose in the dual or A, A transpose in the primal. The same. Um, the dimension of AI transpose is the number of points of the data set. Some of these points may have millions of points. So AI transpose may have a matrix of dimension 1 million. So it's difficult to solve. Well, there are some specialized interpret methods for support vector machines that exploit the fact that you may have a lot of points, so M can be large, but the number of attributes is small. So that means that AA transpose is a large matrix, but it's a low rank matrix. In some cases, so, so, so some approaches can be quite efficient. Okay? 
But when you have a lot of points and a lot of attributes, interpret methods in general, standard interpret methods cannot solve this kind of uh, problems. Okay. Okay. Uh, so this question: uh, the value of new. Well, uh, value of new it's a parameter that you fix a priori. Today. The best implementations uh, for support vector resistance consider a value of new equal to one. Okay, but anyway, it's something that you have to tune. Okay, so when you have an application, it's the safest you can do is to try to solve this model for different parameters new. Okay, uh, by default again, new equal to one. It's the standard value used in in in, in some algorithms uh, in, in some code developed by the machine learning community. Okay. I think all the results I will present later were computed with new equal to one or 10. I don't remember exactly, okay? But are of this order of magnitude. Okay, so how to solve interoperable methods using, this is the, the specialized interoperable method that consider groups of variables, groups of constraints. The idea is the following. Consider this data set A. M can be large, you may have millions of points. So divide the set in K subsets. So basically, that means that consider different subset of points, okay? And then compute k smaller support vector machine. So compute a support vector machine for each subset of points. But of course, if you do that, you can end up with different support, uh, with different separation planes. Then to avoid these different separation planes, we force all of them to be the same by considering these linking constraints. What's the benefit of that? Remember, you consider the, the, the total set of points A, you will have to solve system of equations with A, A transpose, okay? The dimension of this, you factor to factorize this matrix, the dimensions of this, it's, uh, oh, that, sorry, the complexity of factorizing this matrix, it's M to the cube, M is the number of points. You consider k smaller subsets, okay? You have to solve k systems of this form. The complexity of this factorization is k times n divided by k to the cube. The complexity of that is n cube divided by k to square. So this is much smaller than that. Of course, you still have to deal with that. You have to deal with this extra link constraint. But remember, the algorithm I presented at the beginning, it's a good algorithm for these situations, okay? So basically it's, we will solve with the specialized interval algorithm this support vector machine problem, which basically means compute k different support vectors, force all the planes to be exactly the same. That's the idea. Let me, let me show you some results. These are some real world support vector machine instances. These are quite large instances used in the literature. Sorry, this should be n, n is the number of features. Uh, the first instance have a small number of features. The second set have a, a large number of features. Um, this column gives the number of blocks I partitioned the data set. Uh, when the number of features is small, okay, one, uh, one block is enough. Well, because when the number of features is small, um, we can exploit the fact that A is a low rank matrix, okay? Um, when the number of features is large, we are forced to, for, to, to partition the number, uh, well, to partition the data set of points, okay? Uh, well, you can see here that the number of features in this, in, in this particular instance, it's, it's, it's pretty large, okay? Okay, let me show you some results solving these instances with this algorithm, this specialized interoperable algorithm, CPLEX, an algorithm that was developed in the University of Edinburgh specialized is an interval algorithm for support vectors, but it's only a good algorithm when the number of features is small. And with LibSBM, which is one of the best tools, one of the best codes developed in the machine learning community for the solution of support vector machines. Well, in blue, you have the best execution and in red, the worst execution. So you can see that in the first instance, when the number of features is too small, uh, this, all, this code, LibSVM, developed by the machine learning community, has a lot of trouble computing a solution. And in this instance, interoperable methods are much more efficient in general. When the number of features is large, 
you can see that this code, for instance, that this one development in your city in Borough cannot solve any instance. Why? Because it's a code specialized for calls with uh, lower rank matrices. So, for, for instance, when the number of features is small. C++ has a lot of trouble also in these applications, and this new approach is quite efficient. Okay. For instance, this instance, this is a, a very difficult instance. It solved it in three hours. C++ cannot solve it. SVM, OPS can solve it. And Leap SVM requires about one day of CPU. Okay. So in general, that means that, well, this approach, this splitting approach, divide the support, the support vector machine in different groups and consider linking constraints, it's a quite efficient approach. Okay, so let's move to the second application. Second application, it's a data privacy problem. Um, let me explain you a little uh, the problem. This technique is named control tabular adjustment. Let me explain you a little bit the problem. The problem is the following. Let's consider that uh, you have a census in a, you know, for, for a country. So that means that uh, for each individual in the census, you have a, a, a set of variables. And consider two particular variables. For instance, the profession of all the people in the country, the profession at the city. So considering these two variables, profession and city, you can create a two-dimensional table that gives you information of number of people for each profession in each city, okay? So that's a two-dimensional table. But what if you create another table that gives you information about the salaries by profession and city? Um, that means that if in some city, there is only one person with one profession, automatically you are you know the salary of this person. That's something that, ha that has to be avoided. And one of the techniques to control this, to avoid this, 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 this data privacy problem, it's control at tabular adjustment. The idea, of the idea of control at tabular adjustment is the following. Consider that these constraints, A, A equal to B, are the constraints that uh, model a two-dimensional table at the, as the previous one I explained you, okay? So A will be the cells in this two-dimensional table, okay? So you publish this table, uh, where a equal to b are the constraints of the table. These constraints usually mean that when you add by rows, uh, the, the, the sum by rows of the table is equal to the to the total. The total will be the total number of people with this profession. Or if you sum by columns, you get the total number of persons in in in, in each city. Okay. So the idea is uh, you want to create to add to a a perturbation x, a vector of perturbation x, says that. A multiplied by cell values plus the perturbation is equal to the totals. Okay, and you, we want to minimize the total of the perturbations. So this is an optimization problem formulated this way: we want to minimize the norm of the perturbations. A times x has to be equal to zero. That basically means that A times x plus plus A is equal to b to the totals, and we force some perturbations. Basically, we perturb the cells with the small numbers, okay? Uh, to avoid that, uh, to avoid that, uh, well, to avoid the small numbers in the tables, to avoid that there is only one person with one profession in some particular city. These trunks have a block angular structure in some situations. So consider a three-dimensional table. Consider that you consider the, the, these three variables, profession, city, and sex. And you do the following. You publish this table. This is the table of profession cities for males, profession cities for females, and this total. So this is basically a box of data. Okay, This is a tensor, a box of data. And when you publish that, and you went to this tabular adjustment problem, and you start to add in perturbation, you have to guarantee that when you add a perturbation, you add a perturbation here, you have to guarantee that you add other changes, such that the sum by rows by columns are equal to the totals, but also the signs by the third dimension is equal to the totals. So this is a problem that has a block angular structure. That will be variables of the first block, variables of the second block, last block, and you have linking constraints forcing that the sign by blocks is equal to this total. Okay, so this problem can be formulated as a block angular problem, and this problem has the structure of the interior problem method we are using in this in, in this type of applications. 
Let me show you some results uh, for two different distances. In the first case, we consider an L1 distance for the perturbations. So we have linear optimization problems. In the second case, we consider an Euclidean distance. So we have quadratic optimization problem. Some results using L1 distance in the objective function. These are instances where we are uh, crossing three variables. In the first volume, we have 100 categories, 100 categories, 100 categories. So the final problem has this number of constraints, this number of variables. And here are the results using this specialized method and CPLEX. And you can see the CPU time of each method. For instance, for the largest problem, this one, this solver, block IP, required no more than 250 seconds, and CPLEX required about four hours. Okay, So you can see that uh, splitting the circuit in the type of applications, it, it's, really, it's really important. For L2, the results are either better. Why? Because in L2, we have a non-zero Hessian. And remember, I told you before that the, the preconditioner is better when you have non-zero Hessians. Okay? So in the largest case, this one in the last instance, Block IP was able to solve the problem in less than half a minute, while C plus required about three hours. OK? OK, so let's move to probably the last application. I don't know if I, if I will have time for the fourth one. So let's talk about the, fourth, the third application. The third application is multi-stage stochastic optimization. So this is this is a recent project that I just started with two colleagues, with two Spanish colleagues, with Juan Francisco Monge and Laureano Scudero. They are experts in multi-stage stochastic optimization. I'm not, I'm expert uh, in this in the specialized interpoint method, not in stochastic optimization, but we combined our skills and we were able to get some, we think that it's a good approach for the solution of huge multi-stage stochastic optimization problems, OK? So consider this particular uh, multi-stage stochastic instance. This is an instance with three stages, OK? But we consider two different types of stochasticities. So this is, in, in this example, we have a strategic tree. So these are the circles. So this is the first stage. In the first stage, we have two strategic scenarios, future scenarios, scenario two and three. And for each of these scenarios, we have two more strategic scenarios, four and five, six and seven. These strategic decisions, these strategic scenarios are associated to strategic decisions. These are usually long-term decisions. But let's suppose that we also have a, a, another source of uh, uncertainty. So we consider also operational decisions. These are usually short-term decisions. That means that. For each node, for each strategic node, we consider a two-stage tree, um, which is based on these operational uh, decisions. So in the first strategic stage, we have these two decisions, A and B, which are operational, short-term decisions. In the nodes of the second stage, we have other, other operational decisions, which are C and D, C and D. And in the last stage, in the last strategic stage, we have another set of operational decisions, E and F, E and F, E and F. So this is, in general, a more difficult situation than a standard multi-stage stochastic optimization problem. Why? Because we have both strategic and operational decisions. If, you try, if we try to model this problem as a, a linear or quadratic optimization problem, we have something like that. I will skip details. Just look at the colors, OK? So in this model, this is the model of the previous picture, OK? This is the model for a generic multi-stage stochastic problem with both strategic and operational decisions. So in red, we have um, the different values variables of the problem. X are the strategic variables. Y are the operational variables. And in blue, cyan, orange, and brown, we have the matrix of coefficient for the strategic nodes and for the operational nodes, OK? Um, which is the structure of the constraints of this problem? If you write the structure of constraints for this particular case, for this particular instance, we have that. 
This structure is not a good one for an interval method. Why? Because, for instance, x1 are the strategic decisions for the first node. We see that this is a pretty dense. Uh, we, th 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 these columns are quite dense, so we have a lot of questions in these columns. Same for x2 here, x3 here, and etc. So that means if we build the normal equations, consider this matrix of constraints because of these dense columns, a, a transpose will be almost dense. So that means that if you solve this problem using a standard interval method, we'll have a lot of difficulties, computational difficulties. Okay. So what if we try to consider a splitting of variables of the strategic operational variables instead? Okay. Uh, again, I, I will skip details, but just look at the colors. In red here, it's sorry, in red. In green, we have new variables which are copies of the original strategic variables. And basically, we are creating copies of the variables. Uh, we are this is a splitting of variables, and then we are forced to add these extra constraints. That means that the copy of stage i is equal to the copy of the next stage. In in, in multi-stage stochastic optimization, these are usually named the non-anticipativity constraints. So we consider this situation, okay, then the constraints matrix now has this other structure. What's good here? Well, we have to, th this modeling has one inconvenient is that, well, now we have the number of constraints is much larger and the number of constraints is much larger, but now the constraints, um, has a, have a, a clear structure. We have here some block constraints, and here we have a lot of linking constraints, a lot of non anticipative constraints. But remember, our specialized algorithm, it's a good algorithm to deal with these situations. It's also important to see that which is the structure of the preconditioner. The preconditioner in, in this specialized interval method is obtained by multiplying the linking constraints by each transpose. And it can be seen that if you do that, if you multiply this linking constraint by each transpose, that will be the linking constraints for the previous uh, instance, the previous multi-stage tree. The product of this by this transpose, it's something like that. So remember, this is the system we have to solve at each iteration of the conjugate gradient. And this system has a lot of structure. We have a set of trodiagonal matrices. How many matrices? As many two dimensions two stage trees, nested two stage trees we have in the multi-stage tree. And this is very efficient to, to factorize, okay? Okay, so that's the idea. So uh, we were working with my co-authors, the, the, the other two co-authors in, in this branch for some time, implementing, developing models, and we finally tested two particular applications. Um, the first application was a supply network design problem the second application was a revenue management problem. Okay, um, you can see here. Uh, here I'm just summarizing uh, the, the sizes for the biggest, the largest instances. So for support uh, supply network design problems, uh, we were solving instance linear and quadratic up to 800 million linear variables, 13 million quadratic variables, and up to 20 million constraints. And the number of nodes in the multi-stage tree were this number, up to about 4,000 nodes. For revenue management, we consider linear, linear problems up to 277 million variables, up to 100 million constraints. And the number of nodes in the multi-stage tree was this number, more than 100,000 nodes, okay? What about the results? For the first type of instance, supply network design. Uh, this is a summary of uh, only for the well, we tested a lot of, of instances. This is the results for the four largest instances. These are the results with a specialized interval method. And these are the results with simplex, but consider different variants. Two tuning simplex for, for different models, different variants, um, because we, we wanted to perform a fair comparison. So we saw the different, different models, different. Di different properties of simplex, etc. Okay. And these are the very source we obtain. In, 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 in blue again, the birth result, 
in red the worst result. So you can see the largest case, our algorithm required one day of CPU time, but C++ required almost two months to get the optimal solution. If we consider the memory requirements in gigabytes, okay, you see that this algorithm, the specialized algorithm, never required more than 200 gigabytes, but C++ in some cases required more than 500 gigabytes, okay? What about the second type of problems? For revenue management, you can see here a similar table, okay? I, we tested a lot of instances. Here, we only given the results for the four largest ones. Uh, you can see that for the specialized algorithm, we were able to solve all these problems in less than two days. For CPLEX in red, red are real values. Uh, in orange, we have an uh, estimated number of days. Estimated because uh, we didn't run all days, that's because we were expecting a very long computational time, okay? And you can see that, well, this instance is not so impressive, one half versus two and a half days. Well, we only save one day of CPU time, but in some cases, in that case, we save it a lot of days, 1.7 days uh, respect to less than 20 days, okay? And for memory requirement, we have something similar. The number of gigabytes is much smaller using the specialized algorithm that using CPLEX, okay? And I think that probably I could, I could skip the last application. I, I, I don't know. Uh, so we have time for some questions. I have another application, which is uh, the optimization for some minimum convex cost flow products in B-party networks, but maybe I, I can skip it. It's only three slides. I will skip uh, uh them. I think I, th I think if it's only three slides, you uh, feel free, please, to present them. Uh, we still have some some time. Okay. So the last application is that problem. This is this is a transportation problem. So it's a very famous problem in optimization. This is the transportation problem. Remember, in transportation problem, you have some origins, some destinations. Okay, you have origin nodes I, destinations node J, and you look at this structure. Here, we are minimizing. We have to satisfy the demand of the destination node, and we have to satisfy that the supply in the origin node is not, is not exceeded, okay? So this is the standard transportation problem. But here, we consider that the cost in the arcs can be linear, quadratic, or, general, or, or convex, okay? So you will say, well, this is the standard transportation problem, right? But if you reformulate this problem, you can see that this problem reformulated has this particular structure. So you have blocks here associated. This block basically that means E transpose XI equal to the demand. That means that the sum of all the arcs arriving in the demand node one has to be equal to the demand of that node. And exactly the same. And here you have a set of linking or linking constraints. So this is a reformulation of the transportation problem. And this exactly has this exactly has the, the, the structure, the block structure of our interior point method. So that means that you can solve with block AP this particular type of problems. That's all. Okay? So it's a very simple idea, but it's the first time th this was used for the solution of transportation problems. Okay. So just some quick results. Let's suppose that you consider transportation problems with 200 origin nodes, 1 million customers. For instance, that's the situation, 200 origins or 1 million destinations. That will be, for instance, the problem faced by companies like, 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 like Amazon. You have 200 warehouses or factories uh, or locations, and you have millions of customers, and you have to deliver uh, from the warehouses to all the customers. If you try to model this transportation problem, you end up with an optimization problem of this number of variables, 1 billion, these are millions of variables, 1 billion variables, and this number of constraints, 5 million constraints. If you try to solve this with CPLEX, this is the CPU time you need for the solution of this model. You see, this is a lot of time. Indeed, the last instance, could not be solved with CPLEX in five hours. These are the times needed by Lemon. Lemon is probably one of the best codes today algorithms for, uh, for, 
for for transportation runs. And these are the results with our our algorithm. Well, you can see that the largest instance could not be solved in five hours with simplex, any barrier of simplex, the dual simplex, the barrier, uh, or lemon. And we were able to compute a solution in three hours. These are for linear problems. When we go to quadratic problems, for quadratic problems, the only option to compare is an interpret method, simplex. And you can see for instance of the same dimension, 1 billion variables, 5 million constraints, simplex could not provide a solution in five hours, and we were able to solve it in, in, in less than one hour. Okay? So that's that's so that's a new approach for the solution of, of network optimization problems. Okay, it's use specialized these repair methods for the solution of transportation problems. Okay, so it was a very quick explanation, but okay, so there is some question. Uh, oh. Can I read again? Yeah, it's um, it's in the chat. Um, in the chat, okay. Yeah. How can I see the chat? Um, otherwise, I can read it to you. Uh, so the generic problem structure you showed only contains equality and box constraints. When there is general inequality constraint in the application you show, I understand you can convert them to standard equality representation. However, they introduce a slack variables. Don't they affect the block structure for the composition? Uh, you mean here? Yes, uh, I guess the question is about these slacks. Okay, yeah, of course. We consider a generic formulation where the linking constraints are inequalities. So the sum for all the blocks plus some slack is equal to, to the right hand side. Uh, in the case of equalities, we have no slacks. So because this is an interpret method, the trick to do that is to impose a very small upper bound on the slides. So the, the slides will have an upper bound of 10 to minus 6 or 10 to minus 7. That's the usual approach we follow when we have inequalities, or sorry, when we have equalities. I, I, I think that was the question. OK, thank you. Um, are, are there um, any? And I think that's, that's all. I'm finishing. So a conclusion. I presented a specialized interpret method for block angular programs, and I show you that some standard applications can be reformulated in a way that they have this block angular structure, and then they can be solved using this particular algorithm. And in general, this algorithm is quite efficient, especially when you have large, large, large problems. Okay, here there is a link to the to the page of the solver. And this is a list of, of papers that are based on, on the different applications from the algorithm. And, okay. and, and I think that's all. Thanks, th thanks for the attention. Oh, there is another question. Thank oh. you so much. Oh, there was another question, but I, again, I don't know how to recover the questions. Uh, so the question is, do the data sets have any special property when the IP works better than the lib SVM on a slide 21? What are the reasons for it uh, exactly. working better than lib SVM? It says here slide 21. Twenty, probably this one. Yeah, yeah, it's probably that one. Yeah. Is that twenty? Okay. Uh, well, well, LibSVM uh, implements uh, a particular algorithm for support vector machines. Okay, it's a, it's an algorithm which is named sequential minimization optimization. Um, um, this algorithm uh, performs a lot. It, it, it's a it's a type of gradient method. Okay, uh, but the specialized for support vector machines, and it's it's very fast. Its iteration is very fast, but the convergence is very slow. So, depending on the data set, it requires a lot of iterations. Iteration is very fast, but again, it requires a lot of iterations. And in general, um, well, these are the numbers. In general, uh, for some reason, in some applications, it takes a lot of time. Okay, why? Because of the number of iterations. Okay. It's, it, it, it's, it's a gradient-like method, so convergence is slow, 
and a weapon, and, and that's all. Uh, oh, oh. On the other hand, Lipes VM can work with kernels. That's something that it's well. That's that's something from the field of supervector machines. Uh, Lipes VM can work with nonlinear kernels. Uh, Cplex block IP only work with linear kernels. Okay, so Lipes VM can deal with nonlinear transformation of the original data. But here we are solving only the the the, the case of problems with without kernels. So we are not applying any nonlinear transformation to the original data set. Thank you very much, Jordi. Um, are there, um, so there is a follow-up question. Uh, if I understand correctly, you consider inequality constraint as linking constraint, then in some applications like multi-stage problem, there can be huge number of general inequality constraints. What happens then? Not always. I mean, um, when you have an application with equalities and inequalities, okay, you have to decide which constraints go to the block constraints and which constraints go to the linking constraints. For instance, uh, in that case, in that case, in this particular situation, we decided to move to the block constraints, these constraints, and the non-anticipativity constraints, which are equality constraints, were moved to the linking constraints. Why that? Because this structure is very easy. So usually in this in this algorithm, we try to, to move the simpler structures, the simpler constraints, to the linking constraints part. So in that case, the block constraints are inequalities in general, and here the linking constraints are equality. So we are reversing the order. Uh, it depends on the structure, okay? So in general, you try to make the linking constraints as simpler as possible. Why? Because the preconditioner we are using depends on the structure of these constraints. And we want a simpler, a simple preconditioner. Okay. Um, are there any other questions from the audience? If not, I think we will uh, thank you very much for the nice presentation you gave today. And to the audience, we remind you that next week we will be back. And actually, uh, we will have the vice president, vice president from the European Research Council giving an introduction about the ERC. And then we will have a research talk um from uh, the online seminar series so we hope to see you next week uh, here and dear jordi thank you very much again for coming and making the time okay thanks to you for the invitation thank you for the invitation thanks bye 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 thank you bye. thank you everybody bye.